We've got some here. <laughs> you say in Arabic, l'chaim. <laughs> right. <laughs> How is your Arabic? Oh, gosh. Uh, actually, I've been to uh, several Arabic-speaking countries. I speak two Semitic languages, I would like you to know, neither of which is Arabic. Hebrew, where I'm okay, conversational, but not great, okay? Six months on the kibbutz many years ago, and Amharic from Ethiopia. Right. Two years teaching in Addis Ababa. And I find that with technical Arabic, when they're talking about research, I get about 10%, mm -hmm. okay, because of the other stuff. But otherwise, it's hopeless. How about you? No, considering I lived in Saudi for, well, almost five years, yeah. it's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody, uh, when, you know, everybody speaks English wherever I am. That's the problem. So, so those are my frustrations. Okay, good morning. How was LA this morning? Pardon? How was LA this morning? I haven't looked. <laughs> <laughs> our problem here is our worries about our grandchildren, us, two of which are here in Los Angeles, to our great pleasure. I'm waiting for that to calm down. I want them, my bad grandchildren to move into our house and I'll educate them until they get their MDs, PhDs, and law degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lucky them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Guys, I'm glad that you wrote me about your project again. I was getting worried okay. <laughs> about this four tri semester business. Uh, good. And let me tell you, let me give you my sermon about publication, if you don't mind. This is why you're paying me the big fee, so I can help you at all levels. <laughs> I wish we were in the same town, then at least you could buy me coffee. How do you like that? Anyway, um, the, the view I have is that publication, most people think it's a, you know ego trip. I'm not publishing. I don't care about that. Yeah. Consider, you're, consider you're at a party and you meet a, a young person who's a postdoctoral fellow in some biological research center for cancer. And you say, how's it going? Well, I think we have a cure for stomach cancer. And your cousin, whom you love dearly, has stomach cancer. You say, well, are you going to publish it? No, it's not for public. It's just my own interest. I'm not out to, you know, that's the problem. To me, it's a sacred obligation. Mm -hmm that we publish, and we publish short things, you know my bias about that, so people can read them. So that's, if you're doing a project on academic writing, which is this universal burden, get it out, okay? Yeah, don't worry about your university stuff, because the university is not gonna be satisfied no matter what you do. True. Because yeah. they're interested, in, they're now, things changed about, 20 years ago, because of my university, it's all about money. Hmm. Where USC just, they had a big, every department has to make money. You can't lose. The first thing they did was get rid of the barber shop, which is because they weren't making it. That was where you met everybody. It was wonderful, okay, <laughs> on campus. So, you know, you can have hundreds of publications and awards, but unless you're bringing in grant money for the university, they don't care. Yeah. It's changed dramatically. <clears throat> so the only attitude is to forget them and just publish because you're supposed to. And it's the tax you pay for being an academic. That's my idealistic sermon for, for this morning. Here we go, you guys. This, I'm going to make your life more difficult. Um, <laughs> it is our obligation to work with non-native speakers and go over their manuscripts. Each one of us who are at the native speaker level has, has to do this. It's unpaid obligation because we have this huge advantage in writing because native speakers and we're all very literate and all that. Yeah. So I always read papers by my international, former international students. It's the way we have to do it. Yeah. And they waste so much time in writing the long introductions and all that. I'm just, what you did in your master's, I think was a very good, I, I'm happy to hear that because I think the master's, is supposed to be completing a, a, a number of courses, mm -hmm. which means completing a number of small projects or ideas or term papers. And that's the, as in your case, that's the draft that right. leads to other things. So this is a great, there shouldn't be a master's thesis. Oh my God, what a waste of time. But now's the time where you convert that and 
You'll write short papers. I know you'll get it. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it benefits all around because you, you can get far more done, mm. and people you know, more more people can read it. Absolutely, Steve. What, what's what's your opinion? You mentioned the se second language speaker there. What's your opinion on say, for example, I'm I'm um, I'm doing the same masters as Pfizer's uh, completed, um, and what what we've just done is a, a peer sort of looking at each other's work. We, we've we've sort of checked each other's work over. Um, and there are lots and lots of problems with the non-native speaker. Yep. Is it, do you think it's okay for me to proof? Yes. It is? Yes. Right. More than okay. If you were writing a thesis in all the languages I know, yeah. uh, I would not trust myself yeah. to write academic yeah. papers. I have published in other languages, but I've always been the co-author. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and I've read all the drafts. I've you know written the drafts. And it's always a native speaker, highly literate person goes over it. That is the way it is. We should cooperate it and embrace it enthusiastically. Okay. I think every day I read something by one of my colleagues. Wow. Really? And what's happening too? Interesting. Sociolinguistically, they make mistakes. Their English is really, really good. I mean. Uh, Benico and Cian were uh, professors, you know, of English uh, in their countries, uh, etc. King Suk Cho also. They make little tiny mistakes. Yeah. They, I mean, their English is much better than um, Donald Trump's. I mean, really, they have huge vocabularies. They know about academic writing, and they what they make is tiny things with their cosmetic late acquired. For example, articles. Yeah, okay, they make the and what's happening there is that English is changing. And soon, within a few years, their mistakes will be okay. Yeah. The, the example is, of course, English in India and Pakistan, which is now considered okay. So example, if an Indian scholar writes, uh, John is a boy, isn't it, <laughs> instead of isn't he, that's not a mistake. Right. That is the form of English that's acceptable. All right. And so many people from their English is first language, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the model. And that's what's going to be happening increasingly. We'll become more tolerant of these small deviations and they'll be considered local varieties, just kind of Nigerian English, all that kind of stuff, which is already happening. But we can go over and correct that. I think it's a good idea for now until, you know, yeah. until we're okay. tolerant. Yeah, good. Do it. And it's a little bit each day. It's not a lot, you know. And it, that's our, it's in our self-interest that they write short papers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we can get through all this stuff. I, I'm going to do a couple myself, I think. <laughs> please, please. What are you writing on, Andy? What are you working on? Well, I, I, I want to work on contract cheating, on SA mills, the, um, the rise of it. And, and essentially, we, we give the students so much support that they don't need a contract mm. cheat. They don't need an SA mill. That, that's what I would like, because I don't think teachers have the time at the moment um, to, to essentially give, give the support that the student needs. Because um, I've, I've, done, uh, I've done a lot of looking into it, obviously, because it's, it's my final project, it's my assignment. Um, and I find that the, the biggest problem is, well, that there are a number of problems. Time management is one. Second language is another. Um, parental pressure, as well, in this neck of the woods is, is a big one. Oh, um, yes. And, and so, yeah, a number of reasons. And I think if we could, because my, my job at the university was to support the students, but I didn't have time, enough time, to give them the support that they needed. Now, I used to run workshops and things like that, but they weren't brilliantly attended. Mm. Um, but the ones that did, did attend did a lot better. So essentially, what I wanted to kind of force it down their throats um, and also work with parents as well, you know, so the parents understand the pressure the kids are under. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, essentially, it's, it's offering, I, I want to find out what kind of support we can offer to, to veer them away from these horrible, horrible essay mill sites. Plagiarism, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, the real answer, which is hopelessly idealistic, is that everything is so stimulating that the students fall in love with their work. <laughs> <laughs> and they only look at other people's work to confirm their ideas. I'm going to talk about that, looking at sources yeah. and, okay. and et cetera then it'll disappear on its own. If we reduce the length of the papers, it will be doable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think that's the problem. Then I think half of our plagiarism problems will disappear. Uh, yeah. Andy, what does your shirt say? Duffer. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome again to another edition of the Ninja of the Gora. And once again, we are extremely privileged to have the fabulous uh, Steve Cashin with us today. So I'll hand it over to you, Steve. Take it away. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be with you. Um, today's presentation uh, will be in kind of two parts. Uh, we're going to talk about academic writing, but in order to do that, I first want to talk about how we make progress in science, how we're supposed to contribute. And beginning, I want to talk about theory, because theory is how we do it. Theory is a wonderful thing. It's the foundation of everything we do. Now, the usual uh, definition of theory that most people have is something impractical. It's an idea you come up with when you stay up late at night and you drink lots of cheap wine and you get these crazy ideas and you write them down. No, that's not what I mean. Theory is very serious and very, very concrete. Technical definition, uh, a theory is a set of hypotheses that are connected, interrelated. A so we have to talk about hypotheses. Hypothesis is a guess, a prediction something you think is going to happen. Prediction is very important here. Now, our, our scientific progress has been heavily influenced by a guy named Karl Popper, P-O-P-P-E-R. I think Karl Popper is half wrong and half right. I think we owe him a tremendous debt, but we can't take him 100% seriously. There's more to life than Karl Popper. Karl Popper says, and this part is right, in science, you can't prove anything. The word proof is not scientific. You read in the newspapers, science has proven that this vaccine will work against the coronavirus. No, they'll never prove it. To prove means you've looked at every single case, every single case possible. Let me give you an example from popular linguistics. Let's say I'm a professor of linguistics, which I used to be, and I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is all languages in the world have pronouns. Now, that's a delicious hypothesis. It's a very Chomsky idea. Uh, and I can prove it because I've looked at every single language in the world. Last night, I stayed up late. I looked at 3,423 languages, and they all have pronouns. Mm -hmm. Have I proven the hypothesis? No. You can always say, you haven't looked at all possibilities. Maybe in the deep past, there was a language like Proto-Etruscan that didn't have pronouns, and it's disappeared. So you can't look at every language. And there are languages that have yet to be born that are still developing. Uh, in Los Angeles, where I live, there's a great deal of popularity about a new dialect of English called Valley Talk. It was what the teenagers were talking about the way they spoke English, and there were two pronouns. The female pronoun was babe. The male pronoun was dude. I talked to this dude and his friend, you know, hi, babe, how you doing? And so maybe their pronouns are shifting over time. Uh, maybe someday they'll disappear. We don't know. So you can't look at every particular case. Karl Popper, and he's right, like gravity. Can I prove the existence of gravity? I'm going to drop this pen. Well, so far it's been confirmed, but maybe next time it won't drop. Who knows? You've never, you haven't looked at every single case. All you can do with hypotheses is find supporting evidence. Mm. You can get all the supporting evidence possible, and you still haven't proven it. Albert Einstein knew all about this. Famous quote, no amount of experimentation can ever prove me right. A single experiment can prove me wrong. True. Now, I remember when I was a graduate student at UCLA, where I got a wonderful education, we had symposiums every week where students would present their research or junior faculty, and there was always some jerk in the back, no matter what anybody said, who would say, your idea is interesting, but I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'd like to see more evidence. You can always say that, always, no matter what. Uh, and this is always true. Or it's just theory. <clears throat> All we have is theory, okay? So the way we do science, though, you make a prediction, otherwise known as a hypothesis, 
and you see if it's confirmed. You can confirm it a million times. It's never proven. Uh, we can do experiments to do it. We can do case histories. We use anecdotal evidence. I use all these things, of course. Experimentation is the most solid way of doing it, but I pay attention to all this other stuff as well. Popper says you can replicate your studies, but it doesn't prove the hypothesis. This has given replication a bad reputation. Mm -hmm. The studies of replication, there's some wonderful work. I have whole collections of replications, books about replication, etc. Replication is a good thing, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, journals are prejudiced against replication. This has been shown. The percentage of replications published is minuscule, and they're turned down regularly. My replications, my college rec colleagues' replications have been turned down. We'll talk about rejection. You have to learn to live with rejection. <laughs> it's kind of like being a kid in high school and asking girls out for dates. They all turn you down. You have to live with replication. You have to live with rejection. Uh, and eventually, you'll, you'll do all right. You will find a journal uh, eventually. Short replications are really important. Here's why. This is statistical. Let's, for both of you who remember your statistics class, uh, let's say you do a study and it's significant at the P equals 0.05 level, which is just good enough, so it didn't, probably didn't happen by chance. If you replicate it and you get the same results, it's P at the point like 0.25 level. Each time you replicate it, the odds of it happening by chance are less and less and less. So replication is very, very important. It's a good place to start junior researchers, uh, replicate other studies. Uh, and the best kind of replication, of course, is when you do it in a way where you kind of change it a little bit each time, and it's a further test of the hypothesis. Okay, so that's Popper. We'll come back to Popper. Let's go to Ralph Waldo Emerson, of all people, who was a poet, philosopher, and he made a wonderful statement. The value of a principle is the number of things it will explain. And this, if you find something in one area and it works in a neighboring field, this is wonderful. Karl Popper would scoff and say, no, that doesn't matter, but it does. So I think both Popper and Emerson are correct. Um, when you have a hypothesis and it works in an area that it wasn't designed for, uh, I'll give you my anecdotes because they're the ones I know the best and I like to show off. Uh, my original studies on comprehensible input that I've told you guys about already uh, were initially designed were on studies of older students in their 20s and 30s, advanced graduate students and uh, who were studying English as a second language, where I was teaching at Queens College in New York way back in the old days. And that's where the theory began, where we got acquisition, learning, natural order, all the things. Then we saw that it worked for children acquiring English as a second language. How about that? Then I discovered that it worked for children in English as a first language. Then the natural order would seem to work for other languages. How do you like that? So I had no idea this would be true, but it's very impressive when that happens. Again, you get no credit in terms of Karl Popper, but something is going out here, going on here. Then, oh, the big one, um, the original studies in natural order were on grammatical morphemes, like the progressive marker, third person singular. Then I found that it worked for all areas of grammar. Great day in my life. Uh, I used to take my breaks. Uh, I used to work in the library. I used to do my studying there and writing at the University of Southern California. They had a special education library, which they've now changed into a restaurant. Broke my heart. Anyway, in those days, we had print journals. Things were ever, this was before PDF, all that stuff. And it was so nice to take a break and look at the old journals on the shelf. Yeah. One of my favorite sections was English language arts journals, uh, published in the 1890s, 1910. So interesting. I found articles on spelling. Are you listening, Donald Trump, on spelling, okay? I found one article, Oliver Kornman, 
1898, something like that, called The Futility of the Spelling Grind. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Arnold uh, Kornman and his other guys, a guy named Rice, did studies around this time, 1902, where they had uh, student scores on spelling tests. English is a first language. And they divided it up into classes that had spelling instruction and those that didn't. What could be more wonderful? Sometimes the kids were excused from spelling because they were good. Other times they just didn't do it. The data was all there. Those days they didn't have the statistical tests that we have. That was developed in the 1920s. So my student, Howard White, and I did the statistics. We found these guys were absolutely right. There was no difference between spelling instruction. We wrote articles, published them. This is beautiful. This counts as if it were a new experiment. As if I had decided, let's see if this works for spelling. And in the year 2020, I did a study. And you see, I replicated it and I found extended it. This counts just as much as if I had done it all last week. This is very good. So we find this in spelling. Uh, I recently uh, published a little bit about uh, animal language. And I had this hypothesis, a lot of people did. I get credit for it, though. Uh, that when in language acquisition, we go through a silent period in the beginning where we don't say much. Animals do too. This is animals uh, acquiring their own signaling systems where they just pay attention to other animals and pick it up. And it's also in animals uh, acquiring human language. Isn't that interesting? Like uh, sign language in the case of a parrot, uh, a little bit of speech, they go through. A so that adds to the validity, even though the Karl Popper view uh, wouldn't give it any credit. Now, sometimes replication doesn't work. Yeah. Two possible reasons. Number one, you're wrong. And we'll talk about that. Another is you haven't looked carefully enough. Keep looking and you find the reason why. This happened to me in the natural order studies when uh, people reported studies where they were not getting a natural order. Uh, this was Diane Larson Freeman's uh, dissertation where she didn't get it, she got it. This is what led to the difference that there's a difference between acquisition and learning. Sometimes the conscious system is invoked, sometimes it isn't. And so that led to deeper, deeper hypothesis. Mm. Well, now let's go to what happens when you're wrong and the possibility that you really are wrong, which happens a lot. Let me quote the true living master, Noam Chomsky. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. <laughs> Uh, people say, you know, well, I, I had this argument with a colleague of mine when I first presented the stuff, and I claimed that I had the hypothesis that it's comprehensible and that make things worse. One of my critics, friendly opposition, uh, said, well, I, I don't want to really state this. This scholar had actually said it before I did. And I said, you know, you got there first. I'd prefer to state this hypothesis in your name that I... No, 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 I don't want to do this. I, I, maybe it's wrong. We have to be cautious. And she wrote several articles, a plea for caution, basically attacking me. I could you know, read between the lines. I'm used to that, thanks to therapy and medication. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> this desire to be cautious is a fear of being wrong. <clears throat> and again, we have to go to Con uh, Chomsky in his quote. My son was a graduate student in mathematics at the University of Texas. And one of his professors was a guy named John Tate, who died recently in his 90s. Admirable scholar. He was, he was um, one of the leading algebraicists in the world. Very competent. And there's this story about John Tate. Thanks to my son, I actually tracked it down and Danny sent me the quote. And here it is. John Tate once said something like the following. I spend 50% of my time working hard and not getting anywhere. <laughs> this is John Tate, all right? And maybe 10% of my time making some progress, and 40% of the time wondering how I could be so unproductive 90% <laughs> of the time. Does that sound familiar? Oh my God, that's me all day long, wondering how could I be so stupid to not see this and going back. So here we have Tate, a very distinguished mathematician, making the point even so-called smart people struggle and waste time worrying about it. Um, here is uh, Donald Campbell, another uh, very fine uh, student of uh, creativity. 
Too many potential creators are inhibited by a belief that gifted others solve problems directly, that it just comes. Oh, it's so easy for you. It just flows. No. You see a paper written, you know, it's two pages, and it looks like the person just dashed it off, and it's gone. What you don't know is that that paper went through 50 drafts. Revision after every revision is a finding of your own weakness, where you've made a mistake. You, this is the scientific, say, this is it. Uh, Einstein, I'm very proud of this. Uh, there's a book about Albert Einstein written by Hans Ohanian, which I think is really good because he's nice to me. Hans Ohanian uh, is the husband of Susan Ohanian. I consider my close colleague in language arts in the United States. Susan Ohanian, right, and I, I will tell you about my true relationship with Susan. Uh, we probably exchange email messages over the last 30 years, two, three times a week. I have been actually in her physical presence only twice. <laughs> We've only met a couple of times briefly at conferences. We met at a conference in Chicago, and I actually had lunch with Susan Ohanian and my Aunt Sadie. Aunt Sadie came to hear me speak. That was glorious, okay? So she is very open. Hans, uh, when Hans wrote a book about Einstein, uh, Susan sent me a copy because she knew I was interested. It's called Einstein's Mistakes, The Human Failings of Genius. And I wrote a comment because I read the book and I had read other biographies. You can't help but get interested in Einstein. It's such an interesting case. And what I wrote them is Einstein makes one big mistake. I'm sorry. Uh, Ohanian makes a big mistake himself. The title of the book. The title tells us a lot more than Einstein's mistakes. To paraphrase Kepler, it reveals the wondrous and twisted roads that lead to knowledge. Einstein made mistakes. One of my favorite parts, he submitted a paper to a journal about relativity. Einstein published a lot, by the way, 112 publications, something like that. And, and um, maybe that was Darwin, I get confused, but a lot of publications. He wrote an article with mathematics, something on relativity. The next year, he resubmitted, he wrote another paper on the same phenomena and said last year's paper was wrong. Here's, then he did the same thing again the next year and the next year. So there are four papers that said, I was wrong. Here it is. Here it is. This is absolutely typical. Again, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. I have a friend, I had a friend in the linguistics department years ago. He had a stamp, which he put on his papers. In, in those days, we passed around paper copies to read each other's work. And the stamp says, this does not represent my current position. As soon as he finished the paper, he did that. So we're all, this means you make mistakes and you're revising, okay? Now, who, who are the people who really prove us wrong? Uh, in the days when I was a grad student, all we did was read Chomsky. I was in linguistics, which was wonderful. What a beautiful tutorial on scientific method. Um, and we read the criticisms of Chomsky, and we read everything Chomsky ever wrote. Uh, when I took a course in syntax, the text was Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, 1965. And it was like reading Bulgarian, I have no idea. So I started by reading his first work, Syntactic Structures, and went through it chronologically. When I got to uh, Aspects, it was pretty clear what he was doing. So that's what we all did. We went everything. We were, we were, we were a great, great group in those days. We took it very seriously. Um, and we noticed that when people criticized Chomsky, they didn't do what we did. They got it wrong. They read it hastily and sloppily. They didn't understand what Chomsky was saying. And I felt, we all felt their articles were an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Chomsky pointed out the people who forced corrections in his work and found errors, not big ones, but small ones, were his students. The ones like us who read it, trying to believe it. Mm -hmm. Assuming it was right, trying to extend it. And this leads to an important paper by Peter Elbow, which is the appendix of his book, Writing Without Teachers. It's called The Believing Game and The Doubting Game. Very important. We are taught to play the doubting game as students. Uh, what you're supposed to do is be skeptical, analyze, and look for mistakes. 
and be thrilled when you find them. <laughs> I, I won't mention any names as much as I'd like to, but I had a, a, a colleague who was a graduate student, and she sent me her dissertation. It was out of the natural order, and she found some exceptions. And uh, she reported it, and her advisor was telling everyone, this student proved crash and wrong. He was so happy, so excited. Actually, what happened was she found something that really deepened the theory, mm -hmm. that there was a clear explanation. It was similar to other disruptions of the natural order, but that's because I play the believing game with my work. I assume it's right, and I want to see you know, what the deeper hypothesis is. And he was playing the doubting game. This is how you make um, a reputation. The only way to really understand is to play both games, the believing game and the doubting game. The believing game, Elbow says, allows us to enter into ideas and really understand them. Uh, when I gave talks at uh, the first theory, first, uh, I'm going to mention names now because I'm going to praise the person. Um, UCLA and USC had joint seminars. And one of the first joint seminars is back in the 70s. I announced the theory then. And people jumped on it, uh, looking for problems, especially my rivals at UCLA, et cetera. But the UCLA people played the believing game. There was one of my colleagues who's still an active researcher, a UCLA professor, John Schumann, who does very good work. And he was doubting the theory, but he did it. Well, he was finding things he didn't get but he played the believing game. I remember talking to him about it and he said, I really wish I could crawl into your brain and see how you see these things. He was trying to understand. This, these are critics who are the loyal opposition. This is what we're looking for. Play both games at the same time. He would say, tell me more about that. I'm trying to see things as you see them, basically saying the same thing as elbow nearly word for word. So my advice on science, do both. Look for, so look for flaws and walk in the person's moccasins. Walk in their path, try to find the answers. Okay, I'm gonna go into uh, a couple of uh, aspects of research that might be of interesting. What about old data? I already gave you an example of this where I found this old spelling data. Uh, Chomsky's pal at uh, MIT is a guy named Morris Halley, H-A-L-L-E. Morris Halley works in phonological theory, and he is absolutely wonderful, just like Einstein. Uh, I'm sorry, Einstein, just, just like um, Chomsky himself. And they came out with a book, uh, as, um, Sound Patterns of English, which the moment it came out, we all got it and read it, became classroom text immediately the next day. Can't do that anymore. Books are too expensive. But in those days, we could afford them. Uh, Halley gave a talk in which he announced some old findings, some old data that he found. And people criticized him. He says, oh, that's old stuff. What's wrong with you? Tell us the new stuff. And Halley said, I'm not here to bring you the news. I'm here to bring you the truth. <laughs> that is exactly the, don't be afraid of old data. It's there to help you. Uh, Keith Simonton, Dean Keith Simonton, is a person I have learned a great deal from in the, all his books on scientific genius, etc., he asked this question. <clears throat> if you consider people who are representative of what we call the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, uh, for example, Margaret Mead in anthropology represents anthropology of her era, no question. Uh, Chomsky represents linguistic theory. Would you say they are with the times or ahead of the times? Well, the usual answer is they're ahead of the times. Simonton says, no, they're behind the times. They're stuck on ideas that are no longer popular, and they haven't given them up. Uh, Chomsky is a very good, a very good example of this, these, how these thinkers are, quote, oddly backward looking, trying to consolidate ideas of the past. Uh, Chomsky got excited about French philosophy. Cartesian wrote a book called Cartesian Linguistics, Descartes, The Theories of Innateness. He spent a lot of time with it because this was has been the foundation of his work and still is. So this is why we do more than simple experiments, simple one-time studies. Yeah. Science makes progress mostly 
by looking at old studies. There are two ways of doing this. Secondary analysis, look at old data, reanalyze it, like we did with spelling data. Einstein did this. He looked at the Michelson-Morley studies on the speed of light. Fascinated by them, that was 20 years old. Einstein didn't have a laboratory. He didn't try this out with, you know, cyclotrons and all this. He looked at old data and came to conclusions. So secondary analysis, don't be afraid of it, people who are writing term papers and theses and dissertations and publications. Look at other people's data. Don't be afraid of reanalysis. It's wonderful. Of course, this all leads to what we call meta-analysis. Oh, when I discovered meta-analysis, I owe this to one of my colleagues at, uh, at uh, UCLA, a guy named Ed Purcell, who showed me how beautiful multivariate analysis was. I was already a faculty member. Multiple regression and looking at more studies, meta-analysis. To me, that is the ultimate. In meta-analysis, you look at a whole body of research and you analyze it not as narrative, but you make it quantitative. Each study, you get what's called an effect size, how large the difference was, and then you can do statistics on that. That is just wonderful. The, uh, I'll, we, um, I'll talk about that in a, in a few moments on how that worked with bilingual education, which I think is an interesting lesson. The next uh, gossip topic I want to talk about is related to this, science versus the public and the media. Yeah. Coronavirus, 25% of the public will do whatever uh, Trump tells them. Uh, this is true not just here, but it's true in other areas. Uh, my former students are a good example of this. This is the field of bilingual education. <clears throat> they wrote a paper called, uh, Jeff McQuillan and Lucy Tse, they wrote a paper called, Does Research Matter? Isn't that a beautiful title? An analysis of media opinion on bilingual education. Tell you a little bit about bilingual ed, why it's so interesting. Uh, bilingual ed uh, had its birth uh, in countries where you have lots of immigrants, like in the United States, good example, we have lots of families coming from Mexico, Spanish-speaking families, they speak Spanish at home, not exceptionally well-educated. These are people, hard-working, working-class people who are struggling through life, did not have the advantages that people like I had and that you had, et cetera, growing up with books, literacy, and a little bit of money around, uh, et cetera. And the idea is we got to get them to learn English. So let's do English immersion, all English. Common sense would say that works. It doesn't. What the early studies showed that is if you give the children a certain part of their day or in the primary language, their English is better because they get background knowledge. If, for example, you throw them immediately into a math class in all English, they won't understand it if they don't know any English. But if instead, while they're doing ESL, you give them some math, in the primary language in Spanish, when they do get it in English, it's more comprehensible. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how much English they hear, it's how much is comprehensible. The first meta-analysis was done by a lady named Ann Willig back in the 80s, and she analyzed a whole bunch of studies on bilingual education, did meta-analysis, and she confirmed that bilingual programs work. Um, my former students, uh, Grace McField and her husband, did another study of that, and it really did well. And now the academic world is convinced, the academic world, that bilingual education, when it's set up correctly, produces better English. We know this. Um, McQuillan and Say analyze the research published in journals the years 1984 to 1994, over 10 years, solid support for bilingual education, it done in many different ways. The public against it, absolutely against it. Surveys, it's that we've gotten, made a little bit of progress in the last few years, but in those days, absolutely uh, terrible. Now, why is this so? Well, teachers who know that it works can't be of much help. They don't have time. Teachers can't write letters to the editor. They can't respond to, scholar, to uh, journalists. Uh, teachers have never had it harder, and we thought it was hard 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Teachers don't have time to go to the bathroom during the day. I mean, it's really incredible. The heavy loads, problems, and et cetera. So you can't really put this burden on classroom teachers who already have no time for anything else. 
And that's a problem we have to do something about. Scholars. Some scholars support bilingual ed, but not all. They're playing the doubting game. That's why. They're looking for negative evidence. And this is true in bilingual ed, very true in phonics. Oh my gosh. Uh, in my opinion, having, I think, read all the research, the, the view that the answer to literacy is heavy, heavy systematic phonics, teach them all the rules, doesn't have a leg to stand on. It is absolutely wrong. And people have not read Frank Smith, Kenneth Goodman, who presented the arguments, which are really good. And we've been looking at the data since then and publishing it and publishing it. Kids who get only phonics and a lot of it do better on tests of phonics, where you have to pronounce words in isolation, but not in reading comprehension. And that has been lost on people. So scholars are playing the doubting game. Then there's the media. Oh, now it's time for me to whine and complain. Oh, my. Uh, the media solidly against phonics and bilingual education. My mother and dad had deep respect for the Wall Street Journal. And that was justified because the dad always told me the Wall Street Journal is where you get all the information. And up until last week where I canceled all my subscriptions because I'm running out of money, um, like everybody else, uh, I always read the Wall Street Journal. I was attacked in the Wall Street Journal in the editorial my mother was so proud. My son in the Wall Street Journal, look at that, okay. And it said, there's this crazy professor in California who thinks bilingual education is right. How could that be? That's ridiculous. How can you help a kid in English when you're teaching them in Spanish? They never looked at the research, okay. And what McQuillan and Say found is that scholars were in favor, but the media was dead against. Uh, my, I'll give you two, two personal stories. My cousin, Carrie, got his degree in journalism. I won't mention names, University of Indiana. And he told me, this is about 20 years ago, he graduated. He's now um, a Hollywood kind of reporter. He's really good. He goes to the Academy Awards and interviews people. He looks really cool and he does a good job. But he said, let me tell you something. I complained about the media. He said, these newspaper people, the reporters, they think they know everything. And I found out this is true. There is an arrogance in reporters like you wouldn't believe. Here's what happened to me. Uh, one of many instances. My wife and I were invited to a small social event uh, given by a member of the synagogue. Okay, And she invited her friends. And one other member was invited. Her husband came. I recognized his name right away. Newspaper reporter and a writer who had attacked bilingual education over and over again. In, he was syndicated in all kind of the second-class newspapers, like small-town newspapers throughout California. And I had written responses to him maybe six times. One got published. And I introduced myself to him. I said, we're kind of in the same field, you know, I've read your stuff. He, had, he did not recognize my name, and we, which is, again, an indication that he's not an expert in the field. What can I tell you? If you don't know who Steve Krashen is, who could you be? Anyway, uh, and we start, we had a friendly conversation. It was so interesting. And I said, you ever listen to the, what the research says on bilingual? He says, yeah, there's this uh, professor in San Diego. And I knew immediately who he was talking about, a colleague of mine. And she keeps sending me all her data and her articles. I just throw it out. It's such, how do you look at all this crap? A bunch of, she's good. I know who she is. She's a real <laughs> professional. She, you, we know when she writes something, I always read it. And she's really one of the better people in the field. And he just, nah, who cares about this? And that was it the whole evening. That was the attitude is exactly as my cousin Carrie had pointed out, an assumption that he's right. And he keeps saying these same things over and over again. It's read by millions. I got revenge. These are the moments you live for. At the end of the evening, we were kind of standing around in a circle. Everybody was being very polite. Nice to meet you. And she, uh, the, this guy was there and his wife. And she said, when I met John, whatever his name is, um, I th the first time I met him, I thought he was a jerk. I said, that makes two of us. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so the problem with the journals, too, is that the, the research is hard to read. 
So I don't blame teachers and I don't blame all the reporters for not keeping up with it, especially, except if you call it your specialty, which they do. Mm -hmm. um, and the academics are partly at fault. Here is uh, Hedges, a brilliant uh, scholar in politics. As long as academics write in the tortured vocabulary of specialization for seminars and conferences, where they're unable to influence public debate, they're free to espouse any bizarre or radical theory. In other words, some of my colleagues at the university write in this really incomprehensible prose so they won't be attacked. Mm -hmm. It's long, no one's, and they have this good feel. What they say is right. You know, they make the point. They're very good uh, thinkers, etc. But it's so long, and as he uh, Hedges says, tortured. No one can understand it. I have a hard time with it. So do you. We all do. Uh, and this is really a disservice. They don't run the risk of being attacked. It's a clever device. So they feel good. Their colleagues give them high marks. And another problem related to this is how universities work. If you are a specialist, let's say in British poetry of the 19th century, and you get a job at Harvard or Cambridge, they're not going to hire two of you. You're going to be the only one in 19th century British poetry. As a result, no one on your, in your department is going to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I remember when I got promoted to full professor, uh, I, very friendly department at USC. I'm not complaining about them at all. But my colleagues were mostly in syntax, phonology, grammar, some of them education, not so much. And I remember when I got, the, uh, I got recommendations from other scholars came in because they were the only ones who knew my field. It's, always, it's someone in Bangladesh or in Beijing who knows your stuff, not someone down the hall, okay? So I remember one of my buddies in the department, we got along with, he came in my office, he says, gosh, Steve, I didn't know you were so good <laughs> on the committee. <laughs> this is a friendly, they had no idea what I was doing because they didn't read my stuff. Nobody has time, uh, et cetera. And it was these other people. So that's the problem at the university. That's where people can get away with this. They write this long, complicated thing. Their colleagues aren't going to look at it. They just see what journal it's in. It looks good. Okay, you get your promotion. If you write short, comprehensible papers, you run the risk of people understanding your stuff and getting criticized, um, et cetera. Part of the solution, we write short papers. Absolutely make them clear. They'll be rejected because they're too short sometimes, okay? <laughs> Or if it's obvious, people will think, well, everybody knew this. If you write something that's obvious and clear, uh, these people think, well, everybody knew this all the time. You know, it's so clear. Uh, tell us something new, et cetera. Uh, I've been uh, very active in letters to the editor, and I've, I've probably written a thousand of them in my life. Uh, probably more, probably two, three thousand I've estimated now. Uh, and maybe I'm doing actually pretty well with letters. 10% get published that I write which is double the usual, usually one out of 20. Um, I've gotten at least 20 in the Los Angeles Times. I've been in The Guardian. Can you imagine how wonderful that is? Uh, I've been at newspapers all over the world, the Taipei Times. I know you read that regularly, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it doesn't count too much because not too many people pay attention to this stuff. Uh, I'm in favor of it. It's good because occasionally someone will read one, they might pass it around, and it gives you the talent, the ability to write short stuff. So you can engage in elevator conversation. You meet a scholar on the elevator and you can tell this person in 10 seconds, like bilingual ed comes up all the time. I say, what would you say if I told you that students of good bilingual programs do better in English? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's one sentence, okay? Or kids who have all heavy phonics, they don't do better in reading. They just do better on, you know, pronouncing words out loud, and that's all. <laughs> and if you read a lot, you get the phonics anyway, anyway, you acquire it. So short things like that is wonderful training. So uh, do it. How to make it work? Here's how they work. Newspapers, if it's an isolated letter, even if it responds to an article, and you got to send them in right away, the same day the article, you don't have a chance. They won't publish it if it's just one. But if they get two, three, four, five on the same topic, 
one will get through. So if I submit a letter and it doesn't get in and someone else gets their letter in and it's similar to mine, I can feel good about this. It's like getting an assist in sports, okay? I pass the ball to someone, he scores a basket. That, that's, that's good. That's how we need to operate. I learned this once, again, working with my students, Jeff McQuill and Lucy Say, kind of by accident, we all submitted similar letters to the Los Angeles Times. We had the same reaction. Mine got in. It was because of theirs, obviously. So this is the way around it. I think we need to do this. I'm now going to shift gears and go to the second part of today's adventure in knowledge and research and writing a paper and some tricks and how to do it. Um, I've got a few points to make, some tips. Number one, <clears throat> don't be in a hurry. Work slowly. Take breaks for incubation. We talked about this the other time. Incubation is wonderful. Pick up things, do something mindless. I was talking about this with a colleague this morning. My mistake in taking breaks is to go to the piano. <laughs> no, because you don't want to get up. You start going through hits of the 1930s and 19, button up your overcoat. Oh, let me look at this one. This is so much fun, you know. So I used to be a classical, and now I'm just Irving Berlin, uh, Richard Rogers, all the way, the geniuses, George Gershwin. Yes. Uh, and it's just too much fun. So now I clean the office. I clean my desk first. And I throw two things in the garbage and file one paper, then come back to work. Something mindless, but not too attractive. I've been talking a lot about reading in my earlier presentations. Let me give you the opposite view, and they're both correct. Peter Elbow, write before you read. When you get an idea, don't go looking in the journals. Write down what your ideas are. Get clear on what your position is. Write before you know that you're right. We're not even clear what your ideas are. Elbow says, it's easier to write now when you know less. Mm -hmm. If you start writing, you have, if you start reading, it's like having a big ball of string in a ball and you can't find the end. You don't know where you're going. Start writing. Realize, as I've told you last time, the first draft of anything is shit. Don't worry that it's going to be great stuff. Write it down. Get clear on what your ideas are. Then look at the research. Only after, this takes a little bit of discipline, but oh my gosh. Don't try to keep up with the literature. When a new journal comes on the computer or anything, you see an article, if it's not what you're working on today, don't read it. Put it aside. You'll read it later when you're working on that topic. A guy named Baseman studied this. He went to, he, this is in the old days when we had, you know, paper journals. He interviewed physicists and what they did in the library. These are top physicists. They all looked at the new journals, but they didn't read every article. They only read a few and basically only what they were looking for. The others they put aside, I'll read this one. I'm working on that. I've made this mistake looking at my print journals and articles, and I have found something that I might have read two months ago that has my notes in the margin, mm -hmm. my underlining, and I have no idea of what it was about because I gave into the impulse mm -hmm of reading the article. We're fighting our previous training. It's this undertow. You get the new journal and say, gee, maybe I better read this. It might be on the test. Someone might ask me about it. Well, okay, I'm ready. Yeah, okay, good. I may never read it. Only read stuff when it's relevant to what you're working on at this moment. The other part about writing, of course, is the idea of flexible planning and revision. Get your first draft there, and then change your mind. Go back, reread, reread. And as for the ideas of, of, of other scholars, first think of your own work. Mm -hmm. Wonderful paper, Gluck and Jock, written 1975. We get our ideas from our own previous thoughts. Have some respect for your own creativity. That's where they come from. Only then take a look at what other people do. Okay. Um, 
Another, I'm shifting gears to another point of uh, free advice. There was a great song, Alan Sherman, free advice, free advice, free advice costs nothing and it's worth the price. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so I'm giving you some free advice. Um, what a lot of people do is they jump from area to area. They flit around. I'll do something on here. I'll do something on here. This is the result of infatuation. And I deeply respect infatuation. That is the cover term. We're always falling in love and we all do it all the time. We see some idea and we love it and we want to know more about it, even though it's not what we're working on now. So, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this because it's so interesting. Don't do it. Resist. Write it down. Put it aside for later. The research supports this. I've been looking at research about successful scholars and the topics they choose. Keith Simonson, again, this wonderful uh, person writing on creativity, he looked at, did a, a study of titles of articles, did a, actually statistical analysis. Do people, who's, uh, eminent uh, psychologists, for example, do they use the same words again and again? This is an indication of the scope of your research. For example, memory shows up, short-term memory shows up, influence of marijuana shows up, shows up. The ones who have reputations stick to a few problems and they systematically go through it. They resist the infatuation with good ideas. Infatuation of new ideas, I have deep respect. We all suffer from this. And it's because we're awake and interesting and it's a good sign. Of course, we should be doing this, but we have to resist it. Um, here again is Simonton. The most successful psychologist is one whose research program seems to concentrate on a well-defined set of interrelated topics rather than spreading out to, too thin. So be narrow. Beautiful paper on this, uh, Diana Crane, I found it on uh, the website, uh, et cetera. 150 scientists, et cetera. Those who had more recognition, who won more awards. The ones who did didn't just do papers where they felt like it, then flitting to another, what one person calls hit and run. It's from working on one problem area, getting to understand it, not simply repetition and replication again and again, all that's part of it, but working on related problems within a certain area that are explored. <clears throat> and we have done this. I think this is the, uh, a colleague of mine <clears throat> now, um, Mishan uh, Ashtar, Ashtar, oh God, I hope she's not listening. Ashtari um, is working on heritage language, and her interest is in Farsi, uh, or what is known as Persian spoken in Iran. And the kids in uh, Southern California, are they keeping the heritage language? And she's going at it from a number of points of view. A uh, hypothesis is they're not doing well, and one reason is there aren't a lot of books to read. She's done studies of the, how many books are in libraries. How many books do people pick up and actually read? Is there any indication of that? Uh, do heritage language classes focus on this? What are they like? So she's now got stuff in all related, slightly different methodologies, all focusing on the same area. That's where you make a contribution. Here we go, uh, Walter Cannon here. Progress in research is characterized by a natural development from one group of ideas to another, instead of flitting from interest to interest in an inconsequential matter. Um, how we do research, I'm gonna circle back to doing primary research. We have to open our horizons a little bit. Junior scholars, the classic experiment is wonderful. It's the way to control for the most variables. It's not the only way of doing it. Uh, case histories, so I have a hypothesis that reading is the way we develop language. And I have a case history where uh, Vinico Mason has done many of these, Kung Suk Cho has done many of these. They're very good, where someone makes great progress, say in English, because they have a reading habit. In fact, in one case, uh, Vinico Mason did a study where someone was making good progress and English is a foreign language, a Japanese student, went off to Canada for a year, got a job, working in English, actually took a class in English uh, and stayed with the family and had a good relation, spoke English. She made no progress in English that year, like this much. She then went back and was put on a strict listening to stories and reading program in English, started to move up again, okay? 
This is good, but it's not foolproof. It's not an experiment. Maybe she was free time. She didn't tell us she was really studying grammar uh, before she fell asleep at night. Maybe she went for walks and did flashcards. So case histories are a test that a hypothesis passes, but it doesn't eliminate all the competing hypotheses. I am so excited about something called unobtrusive measures. Oh my gosh, this is great. Uh, there's a book called Unobtrusive Measures, which I highly recommend. Uh, you, if you got it, you would read it as pleasure reading. It's so much fun. I, I didn't list the name of the author, but you can find it. It's called Unobtrusive Measures. You can get it used. They're just as good as the old editions are just as good. One of the studies the authors cite, uh, an automobile dealer in Chicago, Illinois, wanted to find out where to advertise for his cars, Chevrolets. Those days, Chevrolets, big deal. Uh, how do you do it? Well, you can do questionnaires, uh, et cetera. What he did was go to his own automobile dealership, went into the repair shop where there were Chevrolets being fixed, and he asked the mechanics to look to see where the radio dials were set. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? That's where Chevrolet, those are the ones Chevrolet drivers listen to. I love unobtrusive because you don't bother anybody. You don't take their time. You won't get a big grant for it because it costs $2.20 to do a research study, but that's what works. And again, um, Nishan Ashtari did a study like this. She used what she called the wear and tear method Jeff McQuillan invented. Uh, Jeff did a study of how many people go to uh, libraries and take out book for self-help in languages, you know, teach yourself Spanish. And he found that people took the books out, but he examined to see how many pages they read by looking at smudge marks where the pages were creased. The average person maybe read 15 pages. That's all. They gave up. And uh, my colleague, Nishan Ashtari, did the same thing in heavily... Uh, uh, areas of Los Angeles with lots of Iranian families looked at whether people took books on how to learn Farsi, how to learn Persian. Average amount read, 5%, where there's actually anything worn. People are not. Isn't this beautiful? It's just going to the library, taking books off the shelf, and taking a look. If you want to be scientific, you can ask someone to see if it's reliable, same things, but I'm sure it is because there's very little variation, um, et cetera. So that's how to do research, cheap and easy, uh, et cetera. Okay, writing up the research paper. Let me save you some time. Uh, people tell you when you write something, you should think about your audience. Mm. No, okay. you shouldn't. Think about which journal you're going to submit it to. Okay, I'm going to set it a minute to the t Don't do that. This is like editing while you're writing. Forget the journal. Start writing. The article will tell you where it should be sent. Only after you're just about at your final draft, then you can start looking at journals and see what is a good fit. I have suggestions of how to write it up, a sequence, a natural order. And this comes only from my speculation. I wonder if other scholars agree with it. Uh, I'll talk about an empirical paper with numbers and then in general discussion papers, philosophical papers. Every, pa every paper has a central table that has all the results. Mm -hmm. When I look at an article, you do the same thing. You don't have time. You look at the results section and you look for that table right away. So, and that gives you the results. Do that first before you write up your, your version of the paper. And, you know, it's a two by two or two by six table. Here's this group. You give the mean score, standard deviation, the bottom of the T test or the chi square, and that's it. That's what you do first. When you do that, the battle is over. The war is nearly won. You know where you're going. You then do supporting tables. Who are the subjects? How old were they? All the things that are relevant. You do those tables. Make it easy. The first thing you do in writing, you write up, you write up the results section not the introduction, not the procedure, not the conclusion. That should be easy because you got the tables done. Then you go back to the procedure. You write that up. It's going to be easy because you know where you're going. Then the conclusion. Conclusions all have the same structure, and it's a good structure. You begin with a short summary of what you found. Two sentences, 
really. That's all. We found the drug worked for some people, it didn't work for others, and we think this might be the cause, okay? Then there's always an apology section, what you did wrong and why you are no longer worthy of living on planet Earth and all that. Fine. That's uh, okay. You know, there's some flaws and all that, but don't go crazy. It's not this mea culpa, I did this wrong, etc. Then the implications keep it short. What people do now is they write a long sermon on the flaws and what we should do for research next. I find this insulting. I don't want anybody to tell me what I need to do next. Your paper should be clear enough. If I know the field, if I don't know the field, I shouldn't be reading the paper. Mm -hmm. And I can figure out what to do next. The double helix paper, Crick and Watson, the one that was only two pages, their entire implication section was this, and I will read it to you. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. That's it. That was it. If you know the field, you know what they're talking about. If not, you shouldn't be reading the paper in the first place. Okay? So keep it short. That is the problem. People publish their dissertations. You're supposed to say, and dissertation shouldn't have that either. Then you're all done except the introduction. That comes last. Only give people enough information so they can locate the research where it is. So just to orient them to what you're talking about, not a history of every article that's ever been written, whether they did a good job or a bad, that's your dissertation. As I uh, mentioned to some of you privately, I, I think dissertations are an anachronism. Uh, we should, the way they're written should not be. You don't need the long history of every single article, and so-and-so did it right, so-and-so did it wrong. This is not your business. This is journal, you know, this is not the business of a dissertation. It shouldn't be in the introduction. Just give the necessary background so the reader can locate the issue and knows whether he or she should be reading the paper. No more than that. What a relief. Okay. Okay, let's talk about rejection. Uh, a book I highly recommend called Rotten Reviews. This is wonderful therapy. This is all the great uh, classical writers who got their books reviewed and books rejected for publication. Uh, uh, the Peter Principle, one of the great books ever uh, about creativity, uh, five million bestseller worldwide. I've read it. it it's, it's wonderful. Peter Principle says, if you're competent, you'll keep getting promoted, keep getting promoted until you reach your level of incompetence which is why there's so many incompetent people because they keep getting promoted, okay? <laughs> the book was rejected over and over and over again. Finally got published, was an immediate bestseller. Okay? This is why, by the way, I have never accepted uh, what people consider promotion, uh, promotion. I've never become chair. I've never become dean because I know I would be awful at it, bored, I'm not good at it, other people are better, um, et cetera. So you have to resist uh, promotion when it's not for you. Lots, everybody gets rejected. My, my favorite anecdote in the Peter Principle was from a poet who kept getting his stuff rejected. You know, what did you think about all these rejected? Howard Nemiroff. And he says, when I think about all these awful things that people said about my work, you know, I, what did I say that made them so angry? Well, whatever it were, whatever I did, I should have said it harder. <laughs> I thought that was beautiful. Everybody gets rejected. Psychology journals, 76% are rejected. In my field, and some your overlap, some people, in the field of language education, it's much higher because articles are too long. There isn't enough room in the journals, so they have to reject them. Uh, in my field, in the second language acquisition, the journal Applied Linguistics, the TESOL Quarterly, Foreign Language Annals, the articles are so unbelievably long and torturous. They can only fit like five articles into an issue. So of course they get rejected, of course. One of my favorite journals in psychology is Perceptual and Motor Skills, Referee Journal, et cetera. Each issue, it's like that thick. Each issue might have 50 papers, two pages, one page, 
page and a half. Does astrology work? Here's a study when people reacted, uh, et cetera, on lots of different topics. Great entertainment. I have published there and I love their reviews. They keep sending you back for revision until eventually you can wear them down and they'll publish it. But the reviewers are very interested in saving space. And I've learned a lot from them in shorten this, make this, you don't need to put this in, um, et cetera. So this helps a lot. Well, what about rejection also and the, uh, the uh, suspicions we have about journals? Are they arbitrary? To some extent, yes. There is reason for this suspicion. Beautiful paper by Peters and Sissi, I quote here, 1982. Uh, these are top researchers. And this paper I'm going to talk about was rejected by the journal. This is great. They went to the best journals in psychology, and they recopied 12 very successful papers and rewrote them with different made-up names for authors, and they resubmitted them to the same journals. None of the reviewers recognized that the articles had been published already under an assumed name, <laughs> under a different name. That shows you how careful the reviewers are. And all of them, except a couple, were rejected. <laughs> Usually on methodological grounds, okay? So, yes. The, well, a journal, uh, they'll send a paper out to three reviewers. If one reviewer doesn't like it, it doesn't get accepted. I will uh, uh, use all of you as my therapy group and tell you what happened to me. I won't mention the name of the journal. Yes, I will. Foreign Language Annals, <laughs> considered the number one journal. I've published there before and we've done okay. I wrote this paper I was really happy with. And I'm telling you this because it's going to happen to you too. Uh, it's one of my best papers, I must say. It was about polyglots and do what polyglots say. I interviewed Lomkato, this woman I met in Hungary years ago. And uh, I interviewed Steve Kaufman, who's done brilliant work, and he speaks 20 languages. Oh, my gosh. And I know him, all that. I've talked to him. And their views on language acquisition. And I related it to my theory, all claiming that it proved me right, et cetera. Um, and I sent it to, I thought foreign language channels would like it, practical, theoretical. The review, one reviewer didn't like it. One. The others thought it was fine. Okay. And the one reviewer's complaint was, well, Krashen has been criticized over and over again, and he doesn't mention that in these papers, in this paper. He should mention his criticisms and his responses. I wrote back and said, nothing doing. I've already responded to every single criticism over and over. I, wrote, I, I think I have about 100 rebuttals or responses to critics that I've published already, whole books, et cetera. And I'm not going to repeat it when it has nothing to do with the paper. I'm not going to cite it. The editor said, nope, you've got to do it because the reviewer wants it. I withdrew the paper, of course. So this is what happens. You find one person who, and I got it published somewhere else, one person who doesn't like it, you're dead. So the emphasis is going to be on mediocrity. Mm. If, a, if a paper is terrible, it won't get in. And if it's too original, it won't get in because someone is going to have, you know, some reason. So journals are... Um, are conservative and the way to handle this I think is to realize that this is going to happen and keep at it when uh, this is my last piece of advice today unless you ask a question that I could answer um, when you get when you submit something and you get criticism which you will or comments don't let it sit drop everything and do it right away sit down, go through them piece by piece. You will find that some of the criticisms are really good. And this is the loyal opposition. If you think they're right, make changes and put in a nose thanks to anonymous reviewers. The ones that are wrong, don't change your paper to please them. I've talked to the same conversation. Some will write something that I thought was, just, oh my God, why did you do this? You say, well, the reviewer asked me to do it. And if I didn't do it, I couldn't get published. You just shot yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. This is intellectual suicide. Mm -hmm. If there's a mistake in your article, you are responsible. You can't say the reviewer made me do it. No one's going to take that as legit. Then you should have had the courage to ignore it, uh, resubmit there. And if they still won't do it, submit elsewhere. 
you will find it. Uh, what I had, you are responsible for the content. It's it's your stuff, and you're going to have to live with it forever. We have found, I have found in looking at the research, that eventually the good papers do get published. You will find a place for your paper. You'll have to wait another month or two to get it in, another cycle, but it's your work. You're responsible. Okay, that is the end of today's sermon. We will take a short pause while I drink the rest of my magic drink made from the magic beans, which brings me to life. Steve, have you, have you ever um, put a paper in and, and been rejected <clears throat> or criticized and then thought, actually, yeah, yeah, I was way wrong? Oh, all the time, mm. constantly. And I thank the reviewers for finding the flaws. I find it in my colleagues as well. And just like Chomsky, the colleagues who find the mistakes are my former students mm. who try to believe it, play the believing game. And a reviewer who finds a flaw in your thing has played the believing game, has tried to understand it. You can't do that if you're always, you know, looking, oh, let me find a mistake, let me find a mistake. Mm -hmm. So we're all indebted. This is how we make progress. And I like to think that when I review a paper, uh, I'm doing the same thing. By the way, on reviews, what has happened to me with reviews, I'm, as a scholar, I'm asked to review papers all the time. I get like two, three requests every week. Um, I have a standard letter that I write back. I look to see the paper and I'd say 80% of the time, it's nowhere near my topic. I have no idea what the topic is about. So I politely decline saying this is out of my area. Mm -hmm. The other is about six years ago, I made the decision not to review long papers. Life is too short. I can't do it. Because if I'm gonna review a paper, I gotta read every word. I've gotta read the introduction. It's like reading someone's dissertation. So it's a 40 page paper, I can't do it. What, what I found interesting as well is, you know, you mentioned um, animal language. <clears throat> um, how, how easy or difficult is it to, to, to research something when you don't understand the language itself? Because obviously... Okay, there have been two kinds of studies with animal language. One is animals acquiring codes that, are, that they use themselves, mm -hmm. where they communicate animal to animal. Uh, one of the great studies on this was done with monkeys, vervet monkeys, whatever they are, and their signaling systems. It seems that they have, in this one area, they were threatened by a certain kind of attack, predators. And they got calls to each other to warn them that the predator was coming, depending on the kind of predator. Mm -hmm. So some predators couldn't climb trees. So there was a call saying, go climb a tree. This predator's coming. <laughs> there was another that showed they, they couldn't run very fast. You can just run away. Or another, <laughs> they don't see very well, go hide in the bush. They acquired it by watching older monkeys do it and had a silent period. Mm. And a couple of months later, they started doing the calls. Okay. So what has happened is the uh, primatologists have been observing and videotaping vervet monkeys doing this. So this is a learned system that they're not born with, and it shows there is some acquisition going on, and it obeys some of the constraints. There's also chimpanzee studies, Washao being the most famous one, of um, using sign language. Hmm. They've actually learned sign language and are able to communicate with humans. The best, there's a lot of books about Washao, um, and just look up W-A-S-H-O-O -O and you'll see books, uh, beautiful papers on this. Uh, one study, Washoe herself was given a little baby monkey to raise as a foster child. They used sign with each other. Wow. And the baby only signed with other monkeys, not with people. Ah! Uh, I uh, co-authored a paper, no, I wrote a paper, in fact, about uh, a parrot who actually acquired English. It's on my website somewhere. Um, when I was in uh, Alabama giving a talk, I heard about this woman who wrote a book uh, about her parrot and that her parrot spoke English. And I, when I came, my grandchildren got very excited about this. We were all together once. This is where my, grand, where my son lives and his grandkids. We visited the parrot. It was really exciting. Okay. <laughs> Cosmo, the book is called Cosmo, that the person wrote. Uh, Cosmo has an English vocabulary of about 130 words. 
correctly pronounced. You know how parrots are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, that's about the size of Washoe's sign vocabulary. Isn't that interesting? And if you look at, if you type in Washoe on, uh, what is it, on, on Google, all that, you'll, you'll find recordings of, of Washoe speaking very clear. And uh, she says things like, Cosmo good bird. Cosmo poop in the cage. Cosmo, not poop on floor. Cosmo good bird. Okay. All this stuff, which is real communication. And Betty Jean Craig, who, did, who is her caretaker, professor of comparative lit, talks to Cosmo all the time. They have a warm, loving relationship. And it's all about things that are comprehensible, things that are within her environment. Uh, it stopped when uh, Cosmo was about three years old. She didn't get any better. She still has it. So there might have been some kind of critical period, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows? But these are well attested. Comes through comprehensible input, obviously. And it's not Cosmo tries something and gets corrected. Deliberate teaching doesn't work. Uh, Pepperberg, who worked on uh, uh, parrots before that came to that uh, conclusion as well, her, her parrots were picking up uh, language, et cetera, that she never taught them. So it's through uh, owners yeah. or caretakers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we call them the, the parrots' servants, actually, <laughs> who take care of them and uh, picking it up. And they write the reports themselves. Yeah. And Pepperberg actually does, you know, sophisticated studies on these things, et cetera. Yeah. I had uh, a cockatiel, and I used to come down every morning and say, hello, darling, and kiss it on the head. Um, and I used to, t I, I taught it to swear as well. It's, it's, it's language was, was pretty blue. Um, but it, it's grammar was always perfect. <laughs> even, like that? even when it mixed the words up, the, the grammar was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It was incredible. It really was. Andy, we'll, look, we'll look forward to your paper, Andy. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Paper. We'll look forward to your paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, Spanish language. A person I worked with before, uh, Susan Curtis, who worked on the isolated child case, had this really interesting hypothesis, I thought. She said animal language has the same limitations as the right hemisphere in humans. If you look at people who've had hemispherectomy, where the left hemisphere has been moved because of uh, tumors and seizures that spread, etc., they develop some language with the, the mature right hemisphere, but it's limited and it's just about the same. Um, Dr. Curtis worked on uh, Jeannie, isolated child case, where she was in isolation all these years and started first language acquisition uh, as a teenager. And I worked on the case briefly for a while. I did the, uh, the uh, auditory tests on her. And the conclusion was she had some language that she developed. And we determined from my testing that she was basically using the right hemisphere. Mm. So that is a wonderful hypothesis. Again, it's not proof that yeah. the right hemisphere yeah. can do this, but, and it looks for evidence from different fields and they kind of come together. So I think uh, Susan Curtis's idea is pretty good. Mm. Yeah, um, going back to rejections, <laughs> another bit of a funny one. Um, I got a re my favorite rejection actually was, um, dear Mr. Pacino, we found your, uh, I found your work um, distasteful and incomprehensible, therefore I'm returning your manuscript. I was really proud of that one. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. It was, it was great, it really was. I was, I was very pleased with it. Yeah. <laughs> People who have no friends, let me tell you. <laughs> There's a classic one posted somewhere. It's in Rotten Reviews. A Chinese journal said, we have gotten your paper and we read it with great pleasure. We were astonished at its brilliance and creativity. In fact, we doubt that we will ever re read another paper like this ever. We will not see another one in the next thousand years. We cannot accept it because we cannot make the standard that high for other scholars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Sure yeah. Yeah, yeah, attain those levels, but yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. I love it. I have a question about the future of academic writing, teaching that at universities. So, uh, we're talking about scholars uh, writing papers and writing shorter papers, mm -hmm. but in this digital context, and now that we've made this massive move online as well. The focus uh, seems to be moving from academic writing courses to um, they, they're, kind of, they're teaching information literacies 
more and more rather than academic writing and research. So my question is that if we lose that in our university undergrad programs, uh, I, I feel that academic writing teaches you logical thinking. It teaches you critical thinking. And uh, there seems to be a massive gap. Uh, students don't seem to learn that. They don't write well. And if we move away from purely academic writing courses, where do you see the, our students going? <laughs> I mean, I see a bleak future. Yeah. Simple, again, I'm full of simple solutions that are naive and won't work, probably. If we go to short papers. Yeah and students read them as part of their coursework. Mm -hmm. They will acquire the style. None of this has to be taught. I think in, as part of an academic career, as part of an undergraduate career, students should have read about 100 research papers, each one three pages long. No big deal mm -hmm. if it's in their era where they're writing a term paper, where they, <clears throat> they will acquire both information literacy, academic literacy, et cetera, painlessly and naturally. Okay. So we all get at least good, some good examples of information literacy from the media, where there's some brilliant articles written in magazines, newspapers that do make the point clearly without a lot of numbers. And some of the students get it when they get interested. And it's up to us to help our students find their interests. Let me switch topics and circle back. We're all different. We all have different interests. The key to happiness, according to, was it Piaget who said, I forgot. Okay, find your interest, find your talent, Picasso said, I think. Find your talent, develop it, and give it away. We're all different, and it, we have to have different interests, otherwise the human race would never survive. Uh, Chinsek Mahali said that if we all have the same talents, we're not prepared for anything different, if anything comes up. This is the problem with the big emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and math. School is the place where you find your interest. It's not the place where you prepare for careers. The best way to prepare for a career is to find out what your path is. When you find your path, you're happy. Hmm. Uh, I floundered around in, in my academic life until I discovered languages and linguistics. Um, I was, you know, in my 20s till this happened. I was a mediocre student. I'd actually flunked out once. How do you like that? I got <laughs> admitted back in. I went off to Vienna to study piano. I thought that was it. It wasn't. I still play the piano. I don't practice very much. I still have a good time. Um, and I discovered languages. I got good in German. I thought this is it. I decided I'd become an ESL teacher, which was a good move, and discovered Chomsky, went into this, and then gradually narrowing it down, discovered my path, and my faculty members helped me do it. They were not interested in my becoming their research assistant. Victoria Frumpkin and Peter Latifoged basically did it. A crucial meeting I went to that Dr. Frumpkin organized to talk about speech errors or something like that, which was her bag. I came to the meeting and she looked at me and said, Steve, what are you doing here? Go away, go do your thing. This is not for you. What a relief. She was absolutely right. And that's what we need to do, help our students. When we get that, they're gonna read fanatically in their area mm -hmm. and they'll acquire the discourse style of good popular writing, information literacy, and they'll start to read the short professional papers. If we have our way, that will be the way scientists communicate. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the solution. They'll get both because they're interested. Okay. Am I naive or what? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about um, uh, publications available freely online. So, you know, uh, that lady's, the Russian lady's uh, website. You can download so yeah, exactly. Alexander Abakian. Yeah, Sci Sci oh, yeah, good. Yeah, so yes, uh, very what, good. what do you feel about that? Should I think they're wonderful? I think they're wonderful. I use ResearchGate all the time, mm -hmm. I post my articles on ResearchGate. What I do is I put them on my website, but not a lot of people are going to find that. And I'm on Twitter, mm -hmm. and whenever anything comes out of any interest to anybody, I post it on Twitter, mm -hmm. but that's not good enough. ResearchGate helps a lot. And these hubs that people are making, 
this is wonderful. This is what we need to do. We need to break the law. <laughs> we do not condone breaking the law. Yeah. Ninja the <laughs> We must do this. And these people who have expensive journals and write useless textbooks have to find another way of making a living. They have to learn to make an honest living. And it's going to be a fight to the death, and there's no way out of it. Committees have to respect open access publications. Yeah. Okay. And it makes their life easier. Because when they promote a faculty member, instead of reading this much, they read that much. Yeah. And they have a pretty good idea what's going on. So it's going to be a benefit to everyone except a few greedy publishers. Mm. Yes, couldn't agree more. Okay, I have one other question about uh, teaching and learning emphasis on that versus research. So if the university is focused on teaching and learning, they don't tend to have such a high ranking as compared to university which are, uh, with a big uh, research output. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, well, the, the fear is justified. The research shows that um, top scholars are not particularly gifted at teaching. <laughs> they're okay. <laughs> they're okay. Yeah. But, and they're not as dedicated to teaching. They're basically people like me, pretty much antisocial, and don't like that. Uh, I'm considered a good teacher because I tell lots of stories and jokes and all that. But I've always gotten good ratings, so I'm not complaining. But I'm not really into it. I'd, when I go to conferences, I don't go to the sessions. I spend a lot of time in my room working. Because to me, that's the excitement. Mm -hmm. Someone has an idea, I want to read their article right away. I want to work on it. I want to correct my talk, uh, all that stuff, look at new things, etc. I go to the social gatherings just to say hello, trying not to look like the antisocial jerk that I am, okay? <laughs> Create the impression that I like people, but I don't. You know, I'd rather do anything. And this is common. Yeah. As a group, uh, top scholars are not particularly social. Uh, they want to do their work, and they're not particularly interested in teaching. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm. Teaching can improve, though, and become more fun. My teaching was fairly painless because I worked at a level one university, USC, and I was allowed to be creative. I taught a course in psycholinguistics, and the focus was on the area of psycholinguistics that I found interesting, because mm. there's no standardized tests that they had to take. I did a course in second language acquisition, and I talked about my stuff a lot, because that to me was where the field went. Very few people have that luxury of where you have to teach to conform to someone else's syllabus. Wow. Nobody learns anything that way, and we've got to realize that. Students don't learn. I learned from classes that were taught the way I teach. I took classes in phonetics, which I'm not particularly interested in, and in psycholinguistics from Victoria Frumkin and Peter Latifoget and from John Aller, who was a big influence on me. They talked about their work. Wow. They told stories. That's, I know a lot about phonetics because Peter got us interested in the back and forth between him and Morris Halley at a conference and the argument they had about which distinctive feature, what about this form and transition? And they made it exciting because it was personalized and narrow. They didn't try to get through a curriculum. From Aller, I learned so much about the value of replication, of having directed research because we read his stuff, which was just right. Yeah. Okay, so we have to loosen up on teaching and allow professors to teach themselves mm -hmm. and help students get interested. And we begin with ourselves, and we need tenure in order to do this, I know that. But the ones who have it can, should take advantage of it, not conform to the system. <laughs> Easier said than done, I know that. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Do you have I haven't questions? got any more questions now. <laughs> See, you're, you're working on... Um, another theory did you say or research on writing so you're, on you're working on you know, uh, what am i can tell you is what i'm doing today uh but i can't even remember oh yes oh gosh i'm preparing for research in collaboration with hong kong and how to get students involved in pleasure reading who have no habit of pleasure reading how to stock a library in such a way that it encourages pleasure reading. 
Hmm. And I'll use the comic book study where they put comics in the library, et cetera. And a study I'm not going to replicate, but I'll talk about. A paper appeared in one of the library journals. Um, it was published in cartoon form. Can you imagine? This author decided, she told her students that when you go to the, when you read a book that you like, yeah. and you take it out of the library, take your pen and put a star in the inside front cover. Uh, you, know, you know, you're defacing a library book, but do it. That's a signal to other students that the book is good. So if a book has 25 stars, other kids are going to read it. That's, to me, that is brilliant, unobtrusive research, um, et cetera. Actually, I was co-author of a short study where we actually tried that in a class in, in Japan. And it did get kids interested looking around. They would go around looking for books with stars. So that is unobtrusive research, I think, that is within my area of focus and interest. So that, that's today, preparing for Hong Kong and seeing these ideas come out. What's interesting in Hong Kong is my collaborators there who work in Hong Kong are overlapping with my interests but have slightly different backgrounds and different experiences, so it's really exciting. They actually deal with kids all the time and bureaucracies, et cetera. So it's every day is exciting. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds pretty good. Steve, uh, thanks so much once again for your time. It's an absolute pleasure uh, learning from you. Um, I feel like I'm sitting in a classroom. It's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, oh no! How could you say that? I After love all that. I'm, I'm <laughs> a perpetual student, so like I love it. Yeah. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? Yeah. Okay, you guys, this is my time where I make you feel guilty. I will look forward to reading your publications. <laughs> uh, it's too much pressure. Okay. No, no, no. Well, I, I, I intend. Oh, let me tell you. Oh, one thing I really <clears throat> helped was I was in Taiwan about to give a speech, and another speaker on the program, who was a professor of English literature in Taiwan, he said, have you ever written any fiction? And he said, well, no, not really. So people have accused me of it, but I never have. Oh. Um, uh, I, it wouldn't be any good. And he said, it doesn't have to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Take the pressure off. Yeah. The only interest is, will it be useful to anybody? Right, yeah. And if it's inter if there's one person in a suburb in Bangladesh who's going to look at it and it's going to help them, you'll get a note from them. Mm -hmm. They say, I saw your article and it, I'm teaching fourth grade. And I tried what you did. It really helped. Then you've hit the jackpot and that will help. Is it useful? Yeah.